Hey, my name is Denise Harlow. I'm with the Community Action Partnership, and we're pleased to have you on today's webinar focusing on the Community Services Block Grant new model state plan. We're going to talk about how the model state plan fits in with certainly all the other performance management changes that are coming down the pike for community action. So thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us here today. A few things we are going to be recording today's webinar, so I'm going to pause while we engage the recording. Great. Thank you, Cash. And we are now recording. Um, we will be having everyone on the webinar in mute today because we have a very large crowd. We won't be able to unmute you to ask, ask um, individual questions. However, there is a Q&A part of, on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, please qu click question and answer or question and put in your questions as we go along into that window. We have staff behind the scenes here today who's gonna, who are going to be um, collating your questions and sneaking us notes on the side with what those questions are and we'll be posing them to the panel as we go through this uh, presentation here this afternoon. And when you do click question, please make sure you're sending it to all presenters, and we'll make sure to record those questions and what questions we don't get here to today. We will make sure we document those and try to get questions back out to folks after today's webinar is complete. We will be posting a recording of today's webinar up on our website here at the Community Action Partnership, and we'll be certain to share it with our national partners, NASCASP and CAPLA as well, uh, for posting a variety of other places um, on the web. So let's introduce our panel here today. Probably not a lot of surprises on who is on the panel today. We have Jeannie Chapman, the Director of Office, Office of Community Services. As you know, Jeannie um, is kind of the architect of how we're moving through these performance management changes, and we're thrilled to have Jeannie with us today as we walk through uh, this core critical component of the changes to the system. We also have Seth Hassett, the Director of the Division of State Assistance, Seth has been working with all of us very, very closely as we've developed all of these components over the last three years and really trying to move the ball down the field. So I think we're going to have a lot of the experts here today really offering you a lot of information. We also have Jarl Crocker from the partnership here at the end of the table. He's our new director of training in TA and will become the new project director for the organizational standards project. So we want to make sure you start to put faces to names as we go through the transition as well. And finally, we have Liza Lowe. She is the Community Services Specialist at the Division of State Assistance at Office of Community Services, and she'll be walking us through some really core elements here today of the model state plan, and um, she really is, has done a nice job with some other webinars that we'll talk about here in a moment. So I think we're really going to get a good level of high-level picture information, and we have the people here who can answer as best as we possibly can at this point some of the micro-level questions you have here today. So again, please put those questions in the question box, and we will work on addressing them here today. So our agenda. We want to certainly first start with the overall CSBG performance management system, some of the changes that are coming down the pike, including the state and federal accountability measures. You're going to hear that terminology a lot here today. We're going to touch on the organizational standards and how they fit into both the accountability measures as well as the model state plan. And then we're really going to try to walk through what the core elements of the model state plan are and how they apply both to agencies and to states. And today's webinar really is around what do uh, community action agencies, state associations need to know at what level of what the core components of these elements are. So we're going to touch on the organizational standards components of the model state plan, what kind of state training and TA is incorporated and reported on in the, or um, proposed in a model state plan. We're going to talk about how state monitoring is laid out and how those components address either the standards or other elements of state monitoring. We're going to touch on, again, the performance management feedback loop. The whole part about performance measurement is one part, but we've always been talking about we need to manage our performance. So that feedback loop is a critical element of the model state plan, the annual report, the IS, the standards, all those pieces really fit together. And I think an interesting point that folks will make sure you want to stick around and, and hear the full complement of today's conversation, we're going to touch on the American Customer Satisfaction Index Survey and what that will mean for agencies and for states in this cycle for you to provide feedback both to state agencies and to OCS on how this process all works together. So before I turn the ball over to Jeannie, what I want to do here is just refer you to the NASCASP website. You can see there the path if you go to NASCASP and training and technical assistance, you'll be able to get to these three recorded webinars. Now today we're just doing an hour. We're going to do a high level view of all of these components. OCS and NASCASP did four and a half hours of training via webinar, so you too can listen to four and a half hours of webinar training. 
They are actually very well done, so don't let that time scare you. It is a very wise investment of time. They're, they're broken into three separate sections. Um, session one, section two, and section three. Section two, when we, we talk today about the model state plan, I like to keep reiterating section six, eight, and 10. Section six deals with organizational standards. Section eight deals with technical assistance plans. That is in session two. And the quality improvement plan is in session three. So if you want to do what I did and kind of go on and, and do the fast forward on the, on the um, YouTube video to get to the section I want to pay attention to, you can do that. And Liza did a really nice job on those webinars of laying the standards side by side with the model state plan with the federal and state accountability measures. It's a complex system. So today we're very high level, but please go to those recorded webinars and you can really see how these components fit together. Today we want to give you an overview and we want you to be able to be ready to provide feedback to the Office of Community Services, both on the model state plan and the federal and state accountability measures. You can see here comments can be submitted to info collection at acf.hhs.gov. So go to, HA, or go to OCS. And all that information that you need to find is on the Dear Colleague letter from uh, 129 and the Dear Colleague letter from March 10th. Those are up on our website if you can't find them in your email uh, loop, because I know I have hundreds and it's tough to find them. So you can find them up on our website. But we know that de de the deadline for comments really is next week, but we also know many of you will be here in D.C. next week for NCAF. And OCS really needs those comments as soon as possible. We're planning on providing our comments by close of business, well, whatever that means, tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> so I encourage you all to be thinking about, even if it's just one or two comments, Send them in. That's the way the network was heard on organizational standards, and that's how you'll be heard on the state and federal accountability measures, as well as the model state plan. So enough from me. I'm going to turn over to Jeannie, who will kick us off here today. Thank you, Denise, and, and thanks to all the staff here at the partnership for, for helping us host this uh, important webinar today. As Denise mentioned, we've held several webinars in collaboration with NASCAS to make sure that state CSCG administrators and managers are familiar with the material in the state model plan so that they can make robust and useful uh, comments during this public comment period. And we wanted to do the same uh, with the partnership and make sure that uh, all the community action agencies are understanding this component of the performance uh, management framework. And so my task today, the assignment that I was given was to talk a little bit about the overall performance management system that we're putting in place because uh, the state model plan is one piece of that framework and that framework is really built around a vision that, uh, you know, Denise, she said that I was the architect of all this, but I would uh, argue with that and say that really the community action network, the local community action agencies, the state, uh, the uh, state associations, the national partners are all really an architect of this performance management framework. And uh, it's something I think that we're all going to look back on uh, years from now and, and be very, very proud of because it was built um, with the help of all of us and it, and it really reflects all of our best thinking. So some of that vision that I think um, maybe if you're new to the network or you haven't had an opportunity, maybe you're in a local community action agency, you haven't got to travel to any national meetings uh, that you may not have heard about. I just want to lay that out a little bit. And I want to start with the, the bullet point that's really at the bottom of this slide. And that's the point about all of this is to uh, make sure that we have better results for low-income individuals, uh, families, and communities. This whole performance management framework is about us doing exponentially better for low-income families and communities. We've got to maximize our results, and uh, we think that what the framework that we're putting in place will do that. Uh, it's to really look at accountability, um, to say we're planning to do X, and then looking at the actual performance and seeing how we achieved. And an important piece of that accountability is that it's not just at the community action agency level, uh, it's at, at the agency level, it's at the state level, and at the federal level. And you will see today as we go through the model state plan that it's through the model state plan that we make that accountability real. 
Uh, this performance management framework is really about data analysis and using the data uh, to make decisions and to um, really inform the kinds of strategies and services and outcomes that we want to achieve for people and communities and having continuous improvement in what we're doing. So those are sort of the pieces of the vision uh, that drove the creation of this performance management framework. On the next slide, we get a little bit uh, more specific about what are the various work streams or elements of this uh, framework. And the first piece, uh, it's been talked a lot about in this particular room here. There's been a lot of webinars uh, hosted at this location on the organizational standards for community action agencies. And uh, as I think many of you know, um, the Community Action Partnership was very instrumental in working with the network and establishing a set of standards that will really help us um, identify what's unique and good and solid about community action agencies. The standards are a mix of uh, uh, items that are in the CSBG statute, that are in rules and regulations and circulars, and I think we've, you know, really arrived at a solid set of standards uh, for the community action agencies. And hopefully everybody has seen the final information memorandum that we uh, published in January uh, that sort of laid out the expectation uh, around state implementation of the organizational standards. As Liza and Seth move forward in our presentation today, you'll see how we are going to um, follow through with those organizational standards using the model plan, uh, state plan. The second piece of the framework is the federal and state accountability measures. And I, I mentioned that this isn't just about organizational standards at the local level, but having accountability at the federal and state level. And um, a group of folks uh, from across the network uh, worked with the Urban Institute over the last couple of years to establish accountability measures. I wouldn't call these standards. They're kind of a mixture of, uh, of, of standards and outcomes and outputs, and so we're calling them accountability measures uh, for states, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later, and also accountability measures for the Office of Community Services. And much of how we're going to make those federal and state accountability measures real will happen through the model plan. And then finally, the last piece that we're working on is the Roma Next Generation piece, which is really taking a look at where we're, our network is at with Roma and thinking about what do we need to make that a really 21st century performance management system. That work is still underway. Uh, we feel like um, we will be able to get draft, uh, draft IM or draft IMs uh, published by the fall of 2015. So you'll be hearing more about that throughout the summer. Uh, finally, we have sort of a, a, a visual, I think, that brings this all together um, and shows that, uh, that we are really trying to drive both efficiency and effectiveness uh, in the network. So how well did the network perform? We used the organizational standards, the accountability measures uh, for states, the accountability measures for OCS to determine that, and then to determine what difference did the network make. Uh, that's sort of all tied up with our uh, Roma Next Gen, our results for low-income families and communities. Both sides of this uh, diagram are really important. and. Um, I think it's through this framework that we're sort of demonstrating uh, to ourselves and to everyone outside that we really have strengthened the community services block grant and it's well positioned for the future. I know folks were probably very excited um, when they saw the uh, president's budget for 2016 and saw that we were uh, at a level funding. And I think a lot of that has to do the, with the work that this network did over the last couple of years. And I've said many times in public um, and, and in, room, in rooms like this that uh, there aren't many networks around the country that could probably accomplish uh, what I think this network has accomplished in a pretty short time. 
So you're going to hear more today about the model plan and how we're using that avenue uh, to really make a lot of this real. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to um, uh, just emphasize that um, we've, we've published several documents in the last couple months. Uh, some of those documents are final, like the org standards. The accountability measures are out there, and we're um, happy to take comments on those. And then, of course, the model state plan is open for comment, um, and hopefully you may have some comments to make after our webinar today. So, Seth, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Jeannie. Um, so now that we've set the stage uh, with our overall CSPG vision for performance management, uh, we want to spend uh, another few minutes to just touch on the two major uh, performance management efforts that are, are going to be central to our discussion today, particularly relevant to the model state plan. Uh, first is the state and federal accountability measures, and then we'll be talking uh, about the organizational standards for eligible entities. So um, again, to echo what, uh, what Jeannie said, we certainly we credit the field uh, for all your help in getting us this far with the measures and our other performance management efforts, and, and we thank you for your support and input. Um, as you can see in this slide, we, we discussed that the implementation of our, our uh, accountability measures, our state and federal accountability measures, will take place through the model state plan. Uh, and please note that the, the model state plan um, will, will focus primarily on the state measures uh, and, and not the federal measures. Right now, we are accepting comments from the field, as you've heard, and I will just add that uh, we'll take all comments, positive as well as critical, and sometimes those positive comments can be important to us because uh, it emphasizes what people want us to keep and what we don't want to lose in the process. So. Uh, so the next slide, um, this slide shows the categories that the accountability measures will address. Um, on, the, on the right, you see the performance uh, categories. Uh, on the left, you see the categories for states. And on the, on the right are the federal measures. Uh, these categories are the critical functions that states and federal office must perform. And the measures will, are really designed to provide uh, an element of transparency uh, as, as to how well both the state and federal government are doing in performing these critical functions, without which uh, the network will not be able to meet its mission. So let's look first at the state <coughs> categories for a moment. And each category encompasses several discrete measures that go to the heart of performance management in that area. So uh, for example, on the first, um, we have, uh, on the the category of distribution of funds, we actually have two actual measures. One measures where the state was able to distribute funds to eligible entities within a, a 30 calendar days, and another measures whether the state adjusted its grant administration plans based on feedback from the eligible entities, OCS, or other sources. Uh, another example is on the use of remainder or discretionary funds, and whether the state used it in uh, discretionary funds in a manner it had outlined uh, in the state plan, uh, and whether the plan, uh, the state completed the training and technical assistance activities that were outlined in the state plan. Um, and then lastly, whether the state adjusted its use of discretionary remainder funds or whether it adjusted its training and technical assistance plans based on feedback from the eligible entities, OCS, and other sources. And, We'll be talking about what, where the feedback, we mentioned the American Customer Satisfaction Index, and a little bit later in this uh, webinar, we'll be talking about how that, how at least part of that process is going to work. Um, so we don't have time to go through each of these measures in great detail, but the takeaway is that uh, these measures are designed to shine a light on both the state and federal performance and create a built-in feedback mechanism for states and the federal office about our performance. Um, and, and the goal here, again, is to have a feedback loop, uh, continuous improvement in, in our processes and procedures. And later we'll talk more about that, uh, that feedback loop. So now I'd like to move to the organizational standards. And we all know you're very familiar with the standards and uh, that the partnership as the home of these organizational standards, uh, uh, Center of Excellence, has led 
uh, led the effort in developing these, this, these new standards. So again, we, we, we thank the partnership and all of you for the tremendous time and investment um, in creating these standards. We know that they will be, will be able to demonstrate the organizational capacity of our network uh, to do the critical work uh, that we do. Um, so I'm sure that uh, most of you know that uh, states will be implementing organizational standards in fiscal year 2016 and will be integrating them into their oversight, uh, in some cases into their monitoring, into their overall procedures. And hopefully many of you have been talking with your states about how this is going to happen. Uh, what you may be less familiar with is how the standards are going to be integrated into the model state plan. Uh, and how the states will be reporting uh, to us about their use of standards. So we'll go that into a little more detail later, um, but um, let's, let's start by uh, uh, giving an overview of the model state plan. And for this, I'm going to turn uh, things over to Liza Lowe, who's a program specialist here and um, really has been uh, a critical player in the uh, drafting um, and incorporation of comments and other efforts related to this new model state plan. Thanks, Beth. Hello to everyone. Uh, in this part of the presentation, we wanted to give a quick overview of the model state plan before we go into some uh, special topic areas for deeper discussion. First, we wanted to provide some background on our goals for this major effort to reformat and revise the um, CSBG model state plan. Then uh, in, we want to talk about the content of the revised model state plan at a very high level and also talk about how this, um, how the, the new plan will affect the state plan development process overall, the process uh, the state goes through to get their submission together uh, to submit to us. And some states have started to sometimes start developing their plan um, way ahead of time. So that process is different in every state and we just want to touch upon that. And finally, we want to give you all uh, a look at the table of contents of the model state plan at a high level and see a screenshot of what the automated state um, model state plan will look like for states when they're filling it out. So the next couple of slides here outline what we are we hope to achieve with the model state plan revision, the big why, why we're doing it and how we're using the model state plan. Uh, first on, on this slide, um, if we could go back uh, real quick, Cashin. Um, the one significant goal here that we that we want to um, summarize here is just about overall efficiency. That we're we're moving from the old model state plan, which is paper based, mostly narrative, and to a format that's hopefully user friendly, automated, and streamlined in its content. And you may recall some of you have you seen the state plan that your state puts together. That this is. Uh, you know, they, they, you have a paper-based format. It can be a very, very lengthy document with attachments and all kinds of things if you've seen a past submission. Um, you may be able to appreciate that moving that paper uh, plan to an automated system is a big transition for all of us, uh, especially states and the federal office. The automated state plan will allow states to do all kinds of things, hopefully more efficiently, like pre-populate information, generate calculations, and quickly and easily validate or identify missing information, and it should save a lot of time for states. Now, there initially will be a big investment of time for all of us, uh, but for the states and, and for the federal office doing training and getting up to speed on the new plan and the new system, but we believe that this is an investment that will serve us in the long term. Um, and we do note that we will get gain efficiency in the federal office as well, and this will help us a lot as well. So we're excited about the efficiency. Uh, next, we uh, wanted to talk about um, uh, why we revised the model state plan. One of the reasons is to incorporate all the performance management efforts that we have been discussing here. Um, importantly, the data in the model state plan will align with the data in the annual report. So states will, uh, as I believe touched on states will provide their plans <clears throat> for performance in the model state plan. And then in the annual report, um, they, the performance plans will pre-populate and the state will be able to report on how they succeeded in fulfilling or achieving the goals that they'd outlined in the plan. And the model state plan and annual report will kind of go together seamlessly. Uh, in addition, states will use one portal 
one system to enter data for both of those, the mile state plan and the annual report. Third, we are revising the state plan to improve our capacity for data analysis. And this matters because we use this data, um, as we've touched upon, to make our activities all more effective, ultimately translating into better results for the people and communities we serve. The model state plan will provide greater access to data across the CSBG network for all of us. And as noted um, on the last slide, uh, states in OCF will have uh, model state plan and annual report data in the same place, which will help us a lot in the same system. Uh, it, they will, uh, having data available to us will an allow us to make management decisions in a cycle of continual and ongoing program improvement. And we're moving into a future where state and federal managers will just need to spend a lot less time doing administrative tasks associated with um, the model state plan as we have in the past and can focus on what's important, which is the data analysis and making our programs better. If any of you um, have had a chance to look at the draft revised model state plan, you'll see that much of the content in the plan is familiar and is consistent with the types of content collected in previous model state plans in the old format. Most of the content in the revised model state plan is readily available to states now and is based on the Community Services Block Grant Act. Now, the content may look different due to simplified language. Um, rather than just quoting the CSBG Act, we tried to simplify things. The questions also get at very specific information. Rather than asking for a general description of something, we're really getting at performance questions that will help us um, with performance management. And also, the content looks different because the automation features, you'll have drop-down boxes, things like that, um, tables to population. Some content in the plan, however, is new. Um, there are entire new sections uh, of content, such as um, the content on the organizational standards, and there's a section on participant income eligibility requirements, which is brand new. Um, there are specific questions uh, in areas such as monitoring, training, and technical assistance, distribution of funds, uh, et cetera. And in the past, uh, we've collected general descriptions of these kinds of things, um, and now we're getting to a very specific data point in some cases. If Cashin, could we move ahead? Next slide, thank you. Um, also new are some questions that we have pulled from the IS survey that you might find familiar, but we're placing them, embedding them in this part of the performance management uh, framework process uh, at the beginning of the planning performance, planning of the performance period. And of course, the accountability measures are referenced throughout and affect the content of the model state plan in very specific ways you'll see, including framing up questions about steps states have taken to make performance management adjustments, and we'll talk more about that. The revised model state plan may usher in a new era, era of performance management. However, it does not necessarily impact the state's process for developing their state plan, and, and probably not this year, or it may be an incremental change, but we just want to go over the state plan development process for a, for a minute. Um, the same CSBG Act requirements for legislative and public hearings and also for public notice, all of this still applies. Nothing has changed. At, at least in the short term, the states will likely follow their usual process that they may have around these kinds of requirements. The model state plan does call for increased accountability in the state development process in several ways, and because of this increased accountability, there may be tweaks that states do make to their process but the requirements are the same. First, in the model state plan, the state must describe um, the steps they took to involve eligible entities in the in-state plan development. This is new. We are asking them to describe how they involve the eligible entities in this development process. And, and this, secondly, the states, um, uh, in the accountability measures, the, the states will be assessed on how they encouraged eligible entities to participate in the development of the state plan and how the state plan reflects input from the eligible entities. So you can see what we're trying to get at here through the accountability measures and specific questions of the model state plan that we want the states to demonstrate how they involve eligible entities in this process and they will be accountable. 
And the, the bottom line is that the state is accountable for involving all of you and their state network in the process for developing the state plan. You all are partners. And that means that we will be looking, they, the states will actually probably be looking to reach out to you possibly in different ways. It, it just depends. But um, the requirements for this process are, have not changed, but states will have to be more accountable to us and all of us for how that goes. This next slide uh, shows the 15 sections of the model state plan as they're laid out in, um, in the table of contents. And uh, you can see that they rep represent specific content areas, many of which are familiar and some of which may be new. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, who aren't states, the top line is the uh, SF-424 mandatory. And this is the mandatory government form for grantees. Uh, so that may not be familiar for those who don't have to uh, apply directly to the government for grants, but that's what that is. And finally, uh, while it's difficult probably to see on the slide, uh, we do have uh, the table of contents translated into the automated system and presented here as a screenshot. Uh, the system we're using is ACF's Online Data Collection System, or OLDC, and this is our agency's grant system and will ultimately be the system states use to do reporting as well as uh, inputting their model state plan. Now I'm going to turn us back over to Seth to talk more detail about some particular topics. All right, thank you. Uh, so in this next part of the presentation, we've developed a few of the sort of hot topics that we think are of particular interest potentially to you and uh, are areas that we think are important to emphasize about where, especially where we're doing something uh, new or different in the model state plan. And what we'd like to do here is, uh, you know, potentially be a little more conversational with the panel. So I will be, we'll be introducing the major topics, going through uh, some basic information, um, certainly then uh, Jeannie or Denise um, will have the opportunity to chime in with additional or others at the table, other information uh, or emphasis that we want to place. So to start with, we're going to talk um, a little bit about the content on organizational standards and how they're integrated into the model state plan, uh, since, uh, again, we know this is an area that impacts all of you. So in the model state plan, there is a whole section or a set of questions devoted to organizational standards. And in this section, uh, the states will be asked to describe uh, the decisions and procedures re regarding organizational standards. So these include um, the state's choice of standards. So they may uh, get, uh, if you've read IM 138, the state um, can utilize either the uh, Center of Excellence developed standards uh, or uh, an alternate set. And uh, they're certainly at, they're asked in the state plan to uh, describe what uh, what the standards will be. And, and if they if the uh, standards are the uh, center of excellence standards, then uh, essentially that that's a pretty brief response indicating that that's that the standards that will be applied. If there are an alternate set, of course, they will be need to be uh, provided. State will also describe. Uh, the state level implementation process, which is the means or mechanism by which the state will implement the standards. Uh, so this can be by rule, it can be by policy, contract, some combination thereof, um, consistent with the state uh, rules, procedures, and um, rulemaking process. And then in this section, states will also describe the procedures and approach that the state uh, will be using to assess the entities uh, uh, against the standards. So uh, these could be a variety, and, and IM 138 describes some examples. Uh, that it's not an exhaustive list, but there may be um, some variation of uh, in inclusion in their monitoring systems, peer-to-peer -peer review, um, uh, self-assessment, and other opportunities. However, uh, as, as IM 138 spells out, there does need to be some objective uh, verification of the standards. And um, finally, the state may describe any special circumstances that may uh, uh, result in specific organizations uh, not being assessed against specific standards or against uh, used it in an alternate set of standards. So this may be uh, a very rare instance of a uh, very, very small um, uh, agency that um, doesn't uh, provide that doesn't receive sufficient funding, 
to um, participate. Uh, we have exempted uh, tribal governments that receive straight uh, funds straight from from the um, uh, state on the expectation that there will be an alternate set of standards developed uh, for tribal entities. So there are some special circumstances that can be described. So again, we encourage you to consult uh, in IM 138 if you have questions about the special circumstance exemptions um, and implementation procedures. And then we'll just show the next slide briefly here. This is um, the accountability measures that uh, in that have been uh, developed to that are related to the organizational standards. And these are an error we have received some feedback and we, we are, we're interested in feedback because this is still uh, yet to be finalized. But uh, the accountability measures included the percentage of entities that have met the standards, the technical assistance plans, uh, whether there are technical assistance plans in place for eligible entities that with unmet standards, and whether there are quality improvement plans for entities with serious deficiencies. And uh, just to make that clear, we have, we have uh, in IM-138 and throughout the um, model state plan, we make reference to technical assistance plans and, and, and quality improvement plans. And uh, essentially these are, um, uh, the, the technical assistance plan is uh, for a, an, uh, mostly focused on the standards, an item that uh, needs potentially to be addressed but doesn't rise to the level of a serious deficiency. And a quality improvement plan is uh, one that, uh, uh, again, does, uh, there is a significant serious deficiency related to statutory compliance, um, related to, uh, you know, accounting of funds, other, other major issues, potentially a repeat finding, something that the state has identified um, that requires a, uh, a corrective action and, and may have a potential consequence uh, funding consequence if, if not addressed. So I want to stop here and um, see if there are, um, again, items of, to add or comments with regard to the, how we've approached the adding um, organizational standards into the uh, model state plan. Well, first I'd like to echo what you're talking about around um, the state involving local agencies and associations in this conversation. And we've heard here at the partnership that very many places across the country, agencies and states are sitting down together. Whether it's in committee format, whether it's a month by month meeting, some quarterly meetings, those things are happening. If they're not happening in your state, let us know that and we'll see what we can do to try to nudge that process along because that does seem to be a successful model in a number of states where those conversations are happening, it's going to be critical those conversations happen before these, the model state plan or before they submit their state plan and they're developing all that groundwork now for their, for their public hearings and such. And I agree with us that in terms of noting, make sure, making sure folks know that there are things now a technical assistance plan and a QIP. We're, we're very excited by that option to have a technical assistance plan rather than just a corrective action or QIP. I think it gives us in the network a lot of more options. I know states have sometimes done that informally. Agencies, you know, you, you don't want to necessarily get on a QIP list, but it being on a TAP list, we're going to have to get used to these new acronyms, are, are going to be an opportunity for us. But I think what we're also going to have to make sure is that if we need to make sure we're improving if we're on that technical assistance path so we don't kind of get scooted over to that QIP path. But I think these options are, and they're going to kind of codify it in an IM. I know codify is probably not the right legal term, but having them in an IM, I think it's going to be very, very helpful for the long-term uh, training and technical assistance needs of the network. Mm -hmm. and I can just pick up on that for a minute, Denise. Uh, I think that it, in, the, in the IM, we uh, did sort of make mention that there were several different ways that states may implement uh, accountability and uh, organizational standards. And, you know, states have, it is a block grant, and states have different processes and protocols and rules and laws. and so. Um, we, we made sure to respect that in the IM, and then here in the model plan, we're giving states the opportunity to sort of tell us uh, how they intend to implement. So there's questions about whether they're going to implement uh, organizational standards through a peer review process or through their monitoring process. And we really want states and their community action agencies, as you said, to be talking about those processes 
and what fits for them with what they already have. Um, and if a state, it, you know, some states will have very robust, uh, clear plans and protocols in place already, and so this may be a little bit e easier for them. Other states may not have uh, even identified what a serious deficiency is in the past or what gets um, put in a QIP, and so they may have more work to do. Um, but we're really hopeful. We've said, if you've read uh, the IM on org standards, you've seen that we made it very clear that we expected states and, and community action agencies to work together. Um, and, and now is the time, right? There's certainly, I, I'm thrilled to hear that you're getting positive feedback about folks meeting. And, um, you know, probably a lot of states have already had their public hearing because, um, you know, they're, they're, they're already beginning to work on their plans. So there's a lot going on right now um, uh, to pay attention to. And, um, you know, we, we are encouraged uh, by what we're hearing that, that, that things are, uh, are moving along. So. Okay. So we'll move to the next um, section here. And can we talk a little bit about how the state model state plan deals with uh, the content on uh, uh, state training and technical assistance plans. And in the model state plan, there is a whole section or a set of questions devoted to, to training and technical assistance. And in this section, um, the state describes the planned training and technical assistance activities. And this actually includes a table uh, where, which will include the time frame, the type, the descriptive category for all of the planned activities. Um, and at the end of the year of performance, uh, the state will indicate how, essentially how successful they were in implementing their TNTA plan as outlined in the model state plan. Um, and the model state plan also asks the state to provide um, a statement in essentially indicating that, um, that there are technical assistance plans uh, in place for entities with unmet organizational standards. And we just discussed that in our, in our, our conversation. So one additional note, um, you know, there have been some uh, concerns and comments to date about how this might affect the flexibility of training and technical assistance efforts and concerns about whether um, a state would end up being locked into um, a plan once they've incorporated into their model state plan submission. And I just want to say that that is absolutely, you know, not the intent at all. Uh, the focus here is on, you know, transparency, um, not being um, uh, limited to a plan. If there are good reasons to change mid-year, that's, uh, that's appropriate and fine as long as we can explain the reasons for, for the changes. For example, um, there may be changes in what we learn throughout the year about um, the status of organizations and uh, need to shift resources, uh, you know, to be responsive, and that's, that's appropriate. Um, finally, just want to uh, just mention that um, built into the way we are approaching this, not necessarily in the state plan, although there is, there's an element to the state plan that talks about feedback uh, and how states have addressed feedback um, regarding training and technical assistance. And we have a, an accountability measure on this, and you may recall that, uh, that part of the, this is one area where we will be asking questions uh, related to training and technical assistance, both federal and state, in the American Customer Satisfaction Index survey. So we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further in, in, in a moment. But anything to add with regard to training and technical assistance, um, and particularly the state training and technical assistance plan and the model state plan? Uh, the only thing that I would probably add is that uh, well, I know we're going to talk about more the, the, the more corrective action piece here, but under the technical assistance plan, I think we're going to have to, when you look at making comments perhaps, or when you're thinking about how this is going to relate uh, to the organization, certainly we have a clause here that talks about being resolved within one year. I think that may need probably a bit of refinement. We need maybe to give, need to give some thought to that, but I think it really tells us that we're all here about a chance to improve. It's all about giving folks a chance to invest whatever resources we possibly can to get agencies to meet a new organizational standard. And, and there's not that expectation that we're writing rush out, right out of the gate at 100% because nobody can meet 100% of anything 100% of the time. And I think this option gives us that chance for improvement. Now, for states to have that flexibility, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the model state plan. But yeah, I think it does give a sense of transparency to how TNT resources are spent or what your initial thoughts are. A plan is like a budget. 
It's your best guess of what you think it's going to look like. And then I think when we get the model annual report at the other end of the spectrum here, we're going to see it's not going to be identical because that's just not how those things work. So I think we have to be conscious that it's our best guess that some assumptions is being transparent about how we're planning on providing these services. But the annual report will tell us actually what actually did happen at the end of the game. Okay. All right. Um, so the next section has to do with the content of state fiscal controls and monitoring. And uh, the MSP has a pretty thorough set of questions related to the state's plan for monitoring eligible entities, uh, a state plan for corrective action as necessary, and procedures and, uh, for fiscal controls and audits. And we all know that um, these are areas that we um, uh, that affect the overall credibility of the program, uh, and that that we have found ourselves uh, answering all and many questions about where we stand in terms of our monitoring and audit oversight, et cetera. Uh, so this section has many accountability measures woven into the questions as well, so that state activities for monitoring audits and corrective actions are, again, transparent. Some of the highlights of this section include the state's plan for monitoring, and similar to the state's plan for providing training and technical assistance, the state will lay out its overall monitoring plan in the model state plan, indicating the specific monitoring schedule uh, for the year. And at the end of the year, there will be, uh, we are, the expectation is on the other end, the, there will be a report back on, on the actual success in meeting that schedule. So. Um, any comments to anything to add on that? I guess I would just add that um, one of the things that is new in this area is asking states to indicate um, the agencies that are on quality improvement plans. And we want, you know, that is um, part of the state and federal accountability measures, and we're trying to surface, um, you know, what are the issues in the state, and then what uh, kind of technical assistance and training and action has the state taken to uh, address those issues? And so um, I think this is a new area. I think folks might want to look at this section very closely. Um, we may, if we get a lot of comments on this section, we may make some adjustments. But we do think that in the spirit of accountability uh, and transparency, that, that there needs to be more information for everybody to use to manage better and allocate resources better related to this area. Well, and I agree that folks should probably really pay close attention to this section. Again, this part is in Section 10 of the Model State Plan. You're really going to want to look closely. Jeannie referenced that states will need to be talking about who is on a quality improvement plan. And when you read the, the documents, you know, agencies who have serious deficiencies, so you want to look at what definitions sit there with, with uh, serious deficiencies, well, how that all plays out. Um, so I just want to encourage folks to, again, read Section 6, Section 8, and Section 10 of the Model State Plan. All those pieces together are going to tell you the story of the things that you're hearing here today. Um, there was something I was going to ask you, and it flew right out of my head. Well, that's it'll come back. It will, it will come right back around. Okay. But I, I, just one last thing to add around this, which is that the, the, both the accountability measures that relate to monitoring um, and the, the questions in, in the Model State Plan here, you know, are just heavily, uh, are, are a critical part of, um, they all refer back to um, components of the CSBG Act, especially around um, our need to, at a federal level, again, monitoring of CSBG as a federal and state partnership, and to make sure that um, the full on-site monitoring uh, has taken place and has, uh, you know, according to the model of, the, of CSBG, uh, that it's being implemented um, with fidelity. So. Next, I just want to move to the, to the talk a little bit about the American Customer Satisfaction Index. And uh, so we talked about uh, in, in several sections about a feedback process. The accountability measures require states to take into account feedback from eligible entities, OCS, and other sources. And uh, the state um, is expected to make plans regarding the next performance period. So, OCS is managing uh, an effort to get feedback at both uh, the federal and state levels uh, using a survey uh, based on what's called the American Customer Satisfaction Index uh, methodology. And OCS is not doing this survey. Uh, we would be working um, through uh, the ACSI at, at no cost to the states or the eligible entities. 
Uh, as ACSI, just to give a few highlights, this is a, um, a nationally in, uh, administered OMB uh, uh, approved survey. It's already used heavily across uh, both federal government um, and private sector. It, um, we were using it in 2012 to measure, uh, we used it in 2012 uh, at, to do a survey of states and our direct grantees, uh, our technical assistance centers and others, uh, in terms of OCS uh, functions. And this year, OCS will be administering a survey, again, to the eligible entities to measure their satisfaction and input and feedback related to state performance. OCS will also, again, do a follow-up survey of the states uh, uh, to measure uh, in future satis satisfaction with OCS and our federal performance. So our plan here is to convene a working group, and we're already, I believe, have made the, um, made, begun that work, uh, a survey working group that will include both state and local agency representatives, and they will be working um, in the category areas that we've identified, technical assistance, monitoring, use of funds, um, to identify the specific questions that will be useful, that can be, that are actionable, um, and provide good information for, for everybody involved. So more information will be coming soon on this. Um, just want to go to the next slide quickly to highlight. Uh, these are some of the areas that we're going to be uh, looking at in terms of uh, ACSI. So um, the development and state plan, the participation of local entities in that process, so we've mentioned that a few times, um, input of, on grant administration, the use of the remainder discretionary funds, uh, grant monitoring and corrective action, and just a, some questions related to communication. And let's, uh, let's move to the, there's a feedback loop that's built into the model state plan. So again, each, each cycle there will be an opportunity uh, to provide input either through the survey or other sources. And so another critical point of information is the hearing um, and input that comes from the hearing in terms of accountability in, in these different areas. Um, and the expectation that um, there will be some, you know, again, the, the plan provides an opportunity to share uh, feedback received, but also what was done about it. And last, I just want to emphasize that uh, the, the, the uh, to talk about what will be in the survey, the state survey. And this is the survey, again, that goes to uh, the state CSBG offices and to our other technical assistance providers. So we're looking for input and accountability for our federal office on how we've done. And again, we have measures and our accountability measures that relate to our timeliness, uh, but also to uh, you know quality or feedback elements related to, again, state plan review and acceptance, our uh, efforts at uh, fund distribution, grant monitoring, our, our work with data collection analysis, training technical assistance, communications, and, and all of this results in a kind of an overall grantee satisfaction um, mechanism. And I would say the American Customer Satisfaction Index Survey um, is a pretty neat because it, what it does is it, it's designed not just to, um, to give input but to help identify areas that will result in improved uh, uh, satisfaction, what areas matter most to the respondents and will have the most impact on the overall level of satisfaction. So again, federal and state agencies, uh, we're, we're trying to build in these, these feedback mechanisms, which will then uh, hopefully uh, have a cycle of accountability in OCS. So, any things to add with regard to the Customer Satisfaction Index? So with that, um, just lastly, just what can you do? Um, we again, can't emphasize enough a few takeaways. There are some actions you can take to support the performance efforts right now um, and in the future. First, do feel free to send us your comments on the model state plan and um, the accountability measures. Uh, please listen to the webinars, uh, the NASCAP webinars, if you would like to follow up and get more detailed information. Please talk to your state offices and the CSBG network in your state to learn about the implementation of the organizational standards and uh, the new model state plan efforts in your state. 
Importantly, please participate in the CSPG state plan development process in your state. The input is critical and because of the new accountability and transparency measures built in, uh, state will be looking for your involvement more than ever. So finally, when you get the ACSI survey, please fill it out. Your input will be an important plan, part of the planning and improvement cycle each year. So at this point, we're, uh, we'd like to take questions if we time permitting or? Just a couple, just couple. a couple of minutes, yep. Um, a question came in regarding where can folks find the, the draft automated um, state plan? My understanding though is that that is not necessarily out right now for testing and that sort of thing, it's behind the scenes, but. Um, Right, the, the document, so what we, we are um, sort of a, the challenge here is we want to get what we put out for comment at this point is the, uh, the content that will be included in the automated state plan and, and part of the important thing here of course is that we want to make sure we, before everything is fully automated and uh, uh, that we've, we've made any uh, incorporation of, of important comments. So where we are is that we have, um, on our website, uh, the OCS website, we have the, um, the current, the model state plan, the content, where you go for comments and questions. We've also made a, a PDF, but also a Word version so people can take that information and uh, work with it in different ways um, and use it uh, to try, you know, begin composing responses and so forth. So uh, there will be, as we move forward throughout the summer, we'll be working to provide uh, first, uh, you know, more information about uh, the, the automated version, uh, examples, and, and making that available as it goes. Again, the way this process works, just to kind of give a, a we, we provide it for comment. We take the comments at the end of this comment period. We will then submit it to the Office of Management and Budget, which clears the information collection. There will be an additional period there where um, there's an opportunity not only to, to, to comment, our hope though is that we'll get comments now uh, so that we can incorporate them. Um, but during that time, we'll also be focused on training, um, technical assistance, additional webinars, uh, helping people get uh, even just the basics of accessing the system. At this point, most states uh, have actually accessed, had to access the system, the online data collection system last year. Uh, because they had to add a new form, um, but this will now build on that to, um, to, to have a fully automated system. But I, I just might clarify that the comments that we're taking now through the 27th, we've, we've already started looking at comments that we've gotten, now we've already started thinking about do we need to make changes to the plan? And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and look at all the comments after the 27th, make our changes, so we'll, do, we'll have a document that, you know, we don't know exactly how different it will look yet, but it will probably look a little different. That will go to OMB and that's what is published for another round of comments. Um, so just making sure folks understand that this is, this is the way the document looks now on our website that we've gone over today, but it will, there will be another uh, version of this to come. Oh, great. Um, another question that has come in is um, a concern around completing and probably monitoring standards on an annual basis against, you know, all the agencies in the state, against all the standards, at really, and reporting on it in one moment in time. Yeah. Um, some challenges around that. I, I know that in the first year of the model state plan, states don't have to hypothesize of the percentage of agencies. That's going to be less blank, but certainly in future years, they're going to have to project what they, how many agencies are going to meet all of the standards. So you talk a little bit about some of the concerns that folks Yeah, have? Um, I think this is an area, you know, this is new and we've got to work all this out. Um, I also think that I go back to my earlier comment about this is a block grant and states get, uh, are, have different sizes, different number of community action agencies, different amounts of CSBG money that they get. There's lots of different factors and states have built their monitoring process around those factors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, we tried to be very thoughtful and flexible in the IM and indicate that, you know, you might also use a peer review process, you might allow self-assessment. Um, of course, we would hope that some of that would be validated at some point, either by monitoring or an outside party. And to get at this issue, this challenge of multi-year, 
uh, I, if I were a state, I would think about using a mixture of those processes. So, you know, maybe it's not necessarily monitoring every single year, maybe some other years you use some of these other processes. And I think that that, that, that states, the beauty of this is states have the flexibility to do that. And, you know, I, I think some of our best states are thinking through those potential options with their community action agencies. And, uh, you know, we really are going to try to be respectful, and that's what the law requires uh, of us, is to allow states to develop, um, you know, some of their own processes and protocols around this. But I, I appreciate, you know, um, all the challenges that states have every year uh, and, th and that there needs to be flexibility around that. And we talked to the NASCAS conference quite a bit that the partnership will be working closely with NASCAS to come up with some models that states can utilize. We understand that we're a bit under time crunch to kind of get those models out to states because we know states are as hungry as agencies are to figure out what is and isn't and what is meant and what not meant and how do we monitor or not monitor. So we're committed to working closely with NASCAS to, to make that happen. So, And I think we should also remember that this is the beginning. Um, you know, states may be submitting a one-year or two-year plan, depending on where they're at in the process, and they'll have an opportunity to refine that in subsequent years. And although we want to start off well and we, you know, we want things to run smoothly and be the best we can be right out of the gate, I think we also need to appreciate that, you know, we, you know, we'll, we, we will start and then we will enhance as we move along. Maybe one more question uh, that's come in, and then we'll wrap up for today. We have, okay. Um, we did have a question about where the, when the PowerPoint and slides will be put up. They'll be put up very quickly, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours. But the last piece to here that we have time for probably today, and what we can see, what we can do to respond to other questions that are coming in, because I keep seeing the list grow over there <laughs> on the slides. Um, in terms of the discretionary money, and I know in the state plan, states are going to have to talk about their plan for discretionary resources. Are there any specific standards or guidelines around distribution of those discretionary funds, either to, in, either to existing eligible entities, hmm. uh, to state associations for specific TNTA, any guidance around giving it to non-community action network right. organizations? Right. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So um, first, uh, first and foremost, uh, states need to be guided by the CSBG statute, mm -hmm. um, which does allow great flexibility. Um, I think as long as you were doing something related to poverty and, and community-based organizations, you know, the playing field is pretty big uh, for discretionary funds. Um, but, but after being guided by the statute, you know, I think what the expectation is is that states should be guided by needs assessments, uh, what are the needs in the state, uh, what are state priorities in addressing the poverty area, uh, what kind of feedback do they get uh, in the public hearing. Uh, there, there is a reason that we have the public hearing and that's to get feedback. Um, certainly uh, a lot of states have commissions uh, community action commissions or advisory boards, and I'm, I, I'm sure that they use those uh, places all to garner information and, and prioritize uh, the use of discretionary funds. Um, obviously, a couple of the categories that are listed in the statute are, are about improving the capacity of community action agencies or improving the communication. So, you know, there, is, there are, those are obviously allowable and, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of states are thinking now about the technical assistance that's needed to help the community action agencies meet standards. So I think all those things are in play. Um, like many issues that we have with funding, I always say it's sort of like your tax return. You could spend it five times uh, over before you ever got it because you have so many important needs, um, just like in your household. Um, there's lots of things you'd like to spend your, um, your tax return on and, and you've got to prioritize. So um, I think that the law and then the various mechanisms that states have for feedback are really what should be guiding that. Great. I just want to, just one little thing to add around that, which is that um, in this model state plan, um, the categories, there's a table, for example, to talk about training and technical assistance that remain your discretionary funds, and that's the, the categories that we've identified there are directly from uh, the CSBG Act. And so kind of the idea here is um, to make sure that 
it's, it, it provides a good reference, a good point of reference to what are the, there are a very specific set of allowable activities. You know, there's a, the, all of it has to be for accomplishing the purposes of the CSBG, uh, uh, the, the overall act. Um, but there are categories built into the act, and we built those categories and used those for the uh, model state plan. So it uh, allows us to kind of track against what parts of the of the CSPG Act um, allowable uses are being, you know, uh, most heavily used for TNTA. I wish we had more time for questions because mm -hmm. these are really good questions. It's very interesting. But um, I'll put a plug in for NCAF next week. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we'll do is we'll go through these questions, and I'm I'm speaking at NCAF. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many folks out there listening will be at NCAF. And we'll try to inform some of my remarks by some of these questions. Great. Any final comments then before we sign off here today? Well, then, thank you very much to the panel for joining us here today, coming across town to the partnerships offices, getting out of uh, the OCS offices. And again, Jeannie will be speaking at NCAP next week, and we will. I know we had a few follow-up questions here as well. We'll make sure she has those. and. Uh, We'll look forward to the comments at NCAF, and we know we'll be with many of you over the spring that has finally sprung, we think, <laughs> at a variety of state association conferences. It'll be May is Community Action Month. will be here before we know it. Yes. So I'm sure we'll see many of you soon. Thank you for being with us, and we'll have this posted hopefully in the next 24 to 48 hours. Thanks so much, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you for all you do.